so I'm not recording. So that those who are not here. Oh, okay. At a point, I when you left, I started the recording. I oh, don't good, know if it's gone good. off again. All right, then that that would be good. Yes. So we should. I think we are being recorded now. Right. Uh, yeah. I just started. Yeah. So we can go ahead. All right. Yes. Great. Yes. Yeah, so yes. Yeah, so I was just saying that when you look at the the term alternative dispute resolution, uh, the expectation would be that you you'd have an understanding of ADR being an alternative, another option to some form of dispute resolution, which we are already used to. Now, when we talk of alternative dispute resolution, this is just a reference to a, a range of mechanisms. Can we please mute ourselves? If you are not speaking, please mute yourself so that you don't give us that feedback. When we talk of ADR, we are simply referring to a range of dispute resolution mechanisms or a range of procedures which serve as an alternative to litigation through the court system. So generally when we talk of litigation, the understanding we have of litigation is what? Resolving legal issues through the court system, resolving legal issues by going to court. That is what is generally referred to as what? Litigation. So when you have a legal dispute, you have a misunderstanding uh, with someone arising out of a contract or any other matter. One of the ways you can have that dispute resolved, in fact, the most um, popular or the most commonly used way of resolving disputes in our legal system is by what? Going to court. Now, that process of going to court, that process of taking your matter to court, getting a lawyer, uh, your, your lawyer filing a writ of summons on your behalf, and blah, 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 that process is what we refer to as what? Litigation. However, litigation is not the only means of settling disputes. There is another body, there is another group, or there's another range of dispute resolution settlement mechanisms, which we refer to as what? ADR. Now, these mechanisms that I'm talking about, they are an alternative to resolving disputes through the court system, or they are an alternative to resolving disputes through what? Litigation. So we can simply say that ADR refers to the settlement of disputes by methods or processes other than adjudication, or other than litigation, or other than judicial determination by a court. So generally, when, once again, when we talk of ADR, remember that we are simply referring to a body or a range of dispute resolution mechanisms which serve as an alternative or which serve as another option to litigation or adjudication or simply speaking, going to court. That is why I will not necessarily agree with a student who tells me that um, ADR is when parties go to court and then uh, once they think that they, they don't want to continue with the court system, then they can come to ADR. That may be true in a certain context. Very soon we'll look at court-connected ADR and we'll look at how even the courts are employing ADR as part of this resolution uh, uh, mechanisms. But generally speaking, ADR is supposed to be a group uh, of dispute resolution mechanisms which serve as an alternative or which serve as an option to what? Litigation. So always remember, resolving matters through the courts is litigation or adjudication. Having a court of law adjudicate on a matter, that is what we refer to as litigation. However, that is not the only way that we can resolve legal disputes or legal issues or legal matters. There's a, a, an alternative to litigation which we refer to as alternative dispute resolution or ADR. Please, uh, you can stop me at any point in time and ask me any questions that you may have. Now, I want to, if any of us has a copy of the ADR Act, the Alternative Dispute Resolution Act 2010, Act 798, I'll be happy if you can read uh, section 135 for me. Section 135 of the Alternative Dispute Resolution Act, the ADR Act 2010, Act 798. Because the ADR Act, yes, Mr. Mr. Arthur Emmanuel. 
Imam, your hand is up. You can, or do I have to unmute you? He can unmute himself. Yes. Yes. Or Emmanuel, unless your hand is not up for the purpose that I'm requesting. Good. Please, if someone can read section 135 of Act 798 for us. Oh, no one has a copy of the ADR Act. Let me read the section 135. <laughs> what did you do? Did you say section one, so section three, or what? No, section 135, if I'm not mistaken myself. One. Okay. Other than that, I think Bex is also ready. Bex, if you have seen it, just read it. Okay, please, section 135. It defines the concept as the collective description of methods of resolving disputes. Otherwise, than through the normal trial process. Yes, thank you. So even the ADR Act gives us a definition of what? Alternative dispute resolution, a, de a definition of ADR. And it defines this as the collective description of methods of resolving disputes other than through the normal trial process, other than through the normal trial process. And that is where the the, the alternative nature of ADR as an alternative to litigation uh, comes in. Thank you very much for, for that, Bex. Okay, so with that understanding, I believe that we can proceed. Now, some people have said that, or have argued that ADR is possibly one of those ways that uh, judicial power is taken away from the courts to the extent that they might even want to argue that to the extent that uh, in their opinion, ADR is taking judicial power away or final judicial power, not even final judicial power, judicial power away from the courts, then in their opinion, uh, this concept of ADR may not be legal or may should not be recognized by law. But that indeed is not the case. And I'd want you to look at the cases of Boyfio and NTHC Properties Limited. A similar thing or similar principle is also found in the case of Tete and a, and a Sophie. Now, when you look at Article 125, Clause 3 of the 1992 Constitution, it, it provides that the judicial power of Ghana shall be vested in the judiciary. And accordingly, neither the president nor parliament, nor any organ or agency of the president or parliament shall have or be given final judicial power. So we are all very much aware from our reading of the 1992 constitution that the, the final power to determine the legal rights of parties, the final power to adjudicate on legal matters lies with the judiciary and not any other organ of government. Now, you realize that it has been, this provision I refer to, Article 125, Clause 3, has been interpreted to mean that although the courts have final judicial power, if there's a requirement to submit a dispute to an ADR process, that does not mean that, that we are violating the requirement this resolution which we all need to be to be familiar with Every lawyer now gets, with that yes right? dog yeah uh because of the point that you made relating to uh Boifu, NTAC, and then Esilvi and Tete. Just wanted to remind them that when we're discussing uh, illegality and public policy in law of conflict, we mentioned the rule in Scott and Ivory. How do you call it the Ivory Cross? So what uh, Esilvi and Tete, as well as the explanation Lawyer Gertrude made concerning mm -hmm. the fact that ADL does not really mean to undermine the judiciary as being the repository of the final uh, power. It's consistent with uh, the common law principle that if you make a contract, you can provide 
uh, your own dispute resolution mechanism. And that will have to be exhausted before you go to the normal court. Yeah. So you can continue. Great. Thank you so much, Doc, for um, that reminder. Now, remember the definition of ADR that was we saw in the ADR Act? That ADR is a collective, the collective description of methods. And I had earlier on said that we can see ADR as a, 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 a range or a group of mechanisms which are, you know, which serve as an alternative to uh, dispute resolution using what litigation. So when we talk of ADR, it is not just one process or it is not just a term which is a reference to just one uh, way of, of dispute resolution. It's, it's, a collective, it's, a, it's a term that refers to a collection of methods. So my next question then becomes, what are some of the ADR mechanisms or some of the ADR processes or uh, some of the, the, the methods of ADR that we can, we can mention? This one is quite simple. I want just someone to quickly give us three, three, maybe the most popular three that we always bandy around, just three of them, and then we'll take them one after the other. This one is very simple. You can even just uh, type it in the chat box. I'm asking for the various mechanisms of ADR that you know, or the various processes or methods of ADR that you know. Okay, so I've seen in the chat box, uh, Beck says mediation. Okay, someone even gives us uh, all three. So I see mediation, I see uh, negotiation, I see arbitration, I also see conciliation. All right, if neutral evaluate, okay. I mean, there are so many, there are so many, there are a thousand and one, well, maybe not a thousand and one, but there are so many uh, methods of ADR, but maybe at our level, we need not go through all of them. Definitely when you get to the law school, uh, one of the, the, the courses that you'll be taking is ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution. So you go back to some of these matters into more details than we are doing now. Yes, yeah, so some of the ADR processes like your friends have mentioned in the chat box. We can talk of negotiation. We can talk of uh, mediation. We can talk of conciliation. We can also talk of arbitration. So at a minimum, if you don't recall any at all, Anytime you hear of the word ADR, at least remember that negotiation is a form or a mechanism or a method or an ADR process, same as uh, mediation, also arbitration, conciliation. There are so many, but normally we just want to focus on the major ones. So let's begin with negotiation. When we talk of negotiation, what do we mean by negotiation? I mean, negotiation is possibly perhaps the, the simplest and probably the most common ADR method known, because this is simply a discussion by the parties involved in the dispute, or even their representatives. And that discussion is aimed at reaching an agreement or a settlement. So negotiation, you know what the word negotiation means, to negotiate, to negotiate. is simply in the context of ADR, we are simply looking at negotiation as a discussion by parties to a dispute. And that discussion is aimed at reaching an agreement or settlement. The key thing you need to note is that with negotiation, there's no intervention of a third party. So the parties to a dispute by themselves will sit down without any other person's intervention and try to see if they can settle the dispute by themselves. And this process is what we refer to as what? Negotiation. We can also look at the process of mediation, mediation, which is uh, slightly different from negotiation. Now, when we talk of mediation, uh, once again, it's also a discussion. It's a discussion, but over here, mediation happens with the assistance of a neutral third party who we call a mediator. And this discussion with the assistance of this neutral third party we call a mediator, it is aimed at what? Reaching an amicable settlement of a dispute. So unlike in negotiation where the parties to a dispute sit down by themselves and try to reach a settlement of their dispute, with mediation, it's a similar thing that is happening. But this time around, the parties do this with the assistance of a neutral third party called a mediator. Now, it's important we place emphasis on the neutrality of the third party. 
because this third party or this mediator who is assisting the parties, and I, I mean, another word we need to place emphasis on is, is, is a assistance. The mediator is merely assisting the parties to resolve the disputes by themselves. He cannot impose any solution or any resolution of the dispute on the parties. He's simply guiding the parties to be able to reach a solution or a settlement that is acceptable to both of them. And this is the very reason why the mediator has to be a neutral person. Neutral in the sense that he cannot take sides. He must not have any relation to the parties. He must not have any interest in the matter that is under, under settlement. So what a mediator does, once again, is to help the parties or assist the parties arrive at a solution that is acceptable to both of them. Mind you, for mediation, the parties are free to withdraw at any time. They are not bound to continue with the mediation if they are not, for example, happy with the way the mediation is, is, is going ahead. Same way they are not bound to accept. In fact, the mediator is not even supposed to suggest a, 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 a way of resolving the dispute to the parties. No, he's not supposed to do that. All he's supposed to do is to guide the parties to resolve the dispute by themselves. Now, I'll leave conciliation here for a particular reason. And I'll come back to conciliation at another point, but I'd rather want us to look at arbitration as the next, uh, as the next form or mechanism of ADR. So what we have been trying to do so far is to have an understanding of alternative dispute resolution, ADR. And we have realized that ADR is simply a, a number of processes, dispute resolution processes that serve as an alternative to what litigation or that serve as an alternative to resolving disputes through litigation. We have also come to learn that there are a number of mechanisms or processes that fall under ADR. We have looked at the mechanism of negotiation. We have looked at the mechanism of mediation, which happens with the assistance of a neutral third party called what a mediator. But maybe at this point in time, let me hear your views on what you have heard or what you know about arbitration as an ADR mechanism. What are some of the things that you, you know about arbitration, which you can share with us? Yes, arbitration as an ADR method. <laughs> okay, so I see someone say the decision is final. <laughs> uh, that's good, yes, but uh, what else? If you can have someone, yes, Mr. Nano, you can unmute yourself and speak. Mr. Mr. McDonald, no, no, you can unmute yourself and speak. Oh, okay. Please unmute, unmute yourself. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, Mr. Hello. Yes. Yes. Uh, arbitration involves. Um, the appointment of an arbitrator, that's a third party, um, who, who listens to both uh, the, 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 the side, both sides, and, and then uh, makes a, a determination. And, and then his award is, is, is final and binding on the parties. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for that. Um, now, sometimes, no, thank you very much for that. I, I agree with you. I agree absolutely with you. Please mute, mute yourself so that we don't get the feedback that we are getting. Sometimes uh, I, I, I get a bit, um, uh, you know, maybe surprised at how we, we decide to answer the questions that are posed to us. So, for example, you are asked a question in an exam that what is arbitration as an alternative dispute resolution mechanism. And imagine having a student who says that, oh, in arbitration, the decision is final, or in arbitration, the, fi the decision is final and binding. And contrast that with a student who um, writes out an answer in the nature of what our last speaker just gave. The point I'm simply trying to make is that when we are asked a question, 
let us digest the question, understand it and answer it appropriately. So for example, if I ask you, what is arbitration? I definitely am not expecting an answer like in arbitration, the award is final and binding. I, I would expect you to talk about arbitration being a mechanism of ADR, which involves blah, 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 blah. So that's just a bit of a, a portion or an advice, a friendly advice to us. But definitely like your friend who last spoke said, in arbitration, you have the party submit their disputes for a final and a binding determination on the merits by an independent third party that we call the arbitrator. Sometimes uh, the arbitrator is not just one person. We can have a panel of arbitrators, numbering maybe three or five, almost always is an odd number uh, to aid in the making of, of, a, of the decision. So in arbitration, we are saying that the parties submit their disputes for a final and binding determination. And would explain that by an independent third party called what? The arbitrator, whom the parties have freely chosen. You see, you, we can liken arbitration to litigation. What Please, happened, I have a question. Uh, okay. Well, maybe let me take the question before I go on. Yes, go on. Yeah, sorry, my network has, has not been stable. So hmm. maybe I might have missed something. I'm, I'm, it goes back to negotiations. Hmm. To what extent that the two people who are litigating can come together and negotiate and on whose terms? I hope you, you hear me. I can hear you. Two people who they... have a, a misunderstanding or who have yes. a dispute. Can I agree to? Because if you talk of two people who are litigating, then it means that the matter is in court. The... Then we we'll... okay. Not... Okay. Sorry. So. In terms of both parties. So for example, I may have sold a, a phone to you for thousand Ghana cities. And I assured you that the phone is fit for purpose. There's nothing wrong with it. It is working absolutely fine. Only for you to take the phone, turn it on and realize that, well, yes, it, it turns on just that it is quite slow when it is turning on. So the booting process or the, the, the powering on process takes longer than usual. So on that basis, you come back to me and tell me that, look, this is not what I bargained for. Uh, I, want to, I want to return the phone. And then I tell you, no, once I have sold the phone, there's no way I'm going to take it back. So clearly we can see this as a legal, as a dispute or a misunderstanding that has arisen between you and I. Then I begin to threaten you that, look, if you don't do anything about it, I'm going to take the matter to court. But maybe I also realize that looking at the amount that I bought the phone for 1,000 Ghana cities and the fact that I may want to get a lawyer whose uh, hourly rate is 2,000 Ghana cities and I'll have to pay for filing fees in court and all of that. Maybe let me have a, uh, uh, let me attempt a negotiation with you. So let's sit down and see if we can arrive at an amicable settlement of the dispute. One, I am not happy with the fact that the phone, I bought a phone for 1,000 Ghana cities and it takes 20 minutes for it to be turned on. You are also saying that, look, I have taken the money, I have used it for something, so there's no way I am going to uh, uh, accept that phone. I'm going to take the phone back. Then you decide, okay, well, what if instead of the 1,000 Ghana cities you have paid me, what if I give you 200 cities out of that 1,000 Ghana cities so that you can go and repair uh, that fault which you have found in the phone. And then you realize, okay, I think this is quite a, a good way of resolving the matter. So instead of the thousand Ghana cities, or rather having paid you thousand Ghana cities, give me 200 cities back so that I can use that 200 cities to repair the phone. That is a, a resolution of a matter. And we have arrived at the resolution of the dispute without having to go to court. And that resolution came about as a matter of what? Or as, a, as, as it came about through a process of negotiation. 
So on whose terms? On the terms of both parties. And mind you, that is why negotiation, for example, is not the final step. If you are unhappy with negotiation, you can decide to, for example, involve a neutral third party, and then that becomes a mediation. So the point is that these mechanisms are not necessarily compulsory, depending on the, the, the context or depending on the circumstances. And the parties can at all times, uh, depending on which of the processes are involved, move on to or decide to use another uh, process or mechanism to solve the, the, the dispute. So um, that is what um, I, I have to say. If I, Please, um, does that um, bring some clarity? I'm not yes, sure. Madam. Thinking. Exactly. Thank you. Good. So then we move on to, we were looking at arbitration and we are saying that you see with arbitration, the parties are submitting their disputes for a final and a binding determination by an independent third party who we call the arbitrator. Or if it is a panel, it can be the arbitrator can be a panel, a panel of arbitrators whom the parties have freely chosen. And I remember I was just making the point that you see, um, arbitration is somewhat similar to litigation in court. But the difference here is that, of course, in court, you don't choose your own judge. You don't get to choose the judge who would uh, preside over your, your dispute. But with arbitration, the parties have the opportunity. In fact, uh, one of the cardinal principles underpinning arbitration is what we call party autonomy. Party autonomy means that the parties must consent to submit their dispute to arbitration. And as a result, or as a manifestation of that consent, they are also free to what? Choose their arbitrator. So unlike in court where you don't have the opportunity to sub, I mean, to choose an arbitrator, sorry, to choose a judge to preside over your matter with arbitration, the parties have that opportunity to what? Choose the arbitrator or the panel of arbitrators that would preside over their dispute. Now, the other thing that we need to note is that whatever decision the arbitrator or the panel of arbitrators arrive at, it is final and binding on the parties. So for example, if the matter has been determined on the merits and the arbitrator has given what we call an arbitral award, he has made a decision, that decision is final and it is binding on the parties. What that means is that the parties cannot appeal on the basis of the decision that has been given on the merits of their matter. So you cannot, for example, uh, go to court and say that I am appealing. I, I want the court to take a second look at the merits of the matter. And the reason is that in arbitration, whatever decision the arbitrator or the panel of arbitrators come to, it is final and it is binding. So it cannot be appealed. What happens is that that decision can be set aside on the basis of some stated grounds. I'm saying two different things. The decision is final and binding because you cannot appeal the merits. You can't say that the, the arbitrator had said that a party A um, is, 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 is liable to pay a sum of one million US dollars and you are not happy with that because you don't think that you have breached the contract like the arbitrator has, um, has, has ruled. So you are appealing that determination by the arbitrator. No, that determination by the arbitrator is final and it is binding on both parties. But what can happen is that that decision can be set aside. Setting aside is different from appealing. Very soon, I, I want us to, just, let's just take it one at a time. We'll come back to the difference between setting aside an arbitral award and uh, appealing an arbitral award, which is not possible legally. Now, the, the legal framework within which arbitration operates in Ghana is the ADR Act 2010, Act, Act 798. Uh, so you see that when you look at Act 798, it deals with issues such as um, the effect of an arbitration agreement, an arbitration award, things like enforcing an arbitration award, and so on and so forth. Um, 
what are some of the, the significant features of arbitration? Earlier on, when I asked you to tell me about arbitration, many of you were telling me uh, the, some of the features of arbitration. So the award is final and binding. Uh, the parties are free to choose the arbitrators. Those are all features or some significant or notable features of arbitration. So one, um, the fact that the parties are free to choose an arbitrator or arbitrators to um, preside over their matter. That is very significant. And remember I said that this is because of the concept of party autonomy, which is at the very heart of what arbitration. Now, um, we, we can also say that there has to be an agreement to arbitrate. So the parties must voluntarily agree to submit their dispute to arbitration. This agreement usually can be found in um, an arbitration agreement that the parties would have, or sometimes, usually, more often than not, in an, 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 you, you'll find an, arbitra an arbitral clause, an arbitration clause, which the parties have incorporated into some wider agreement that they have. Now, you pick up many commercial contracts, and you see a clause that says that in the event of any disputes arising under this contract, the parties are to submit the dispute to arbitration. That is an example of an arbitration clause, which you find in an agreement, some commercial agreement. We can also have a separate arbitration agreement, which the parties would conclude or execute separately from the, 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 the base or the primary agreement that they have. Um, we can also say, I think we have already made this point that the decision of the arbitral tribunal is what it is fine, it is final and it is binding. So it is not something that can be appealed on the merits, rather, it can be set aside. And would so I'll come back to subsequently explain what I mean by being able to set aside an arbitral award. Um maybe what we can do next is to look at. Um, no, we, I don't want us to look at this yet. Let us look at some doctrines which are inherent in this process of arbitration. And by this, I am referring particularly to a doctrine referred to as a doctrine of separability, which I'm confident some of you may have heard before. In my earlier submissions, I made it clear that an agreement to arbitrate is a very essential component or is it's is an essential requirement of arbitration. The parties must agree to have their matter submitted to arbitration. But that agreement that we are talking of, mind you, I mentioned that it could be in a, 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 a more broader or a more elaborate contract that the parties have. And you'd find an arbitral clause in there saying that the parties can submit their dispute to arbitration. Alternatively, the parties can conclude a separate arbitration agreement. Now, we have the concept or a doctrine that we refer to as separability, which has to do with uh, this arbitral clause or this arbitration clause that is found or can be found in a broader or a more elaborate contract. Has, has someone heard of this concept of or this doctrine of separability before? And uh, what can you tell us about the doctrine of separability? Separability, separate, separate. It, it, it has, um, it's, it's, it comes, it clearly comes from the word separate, isn't it? Separability. Yes, someone wants to speak. Please go ahead. Oh, I thought I heard uh, a voice. Or oh, is there something in the... Uh, in the chat box. Uh, I think that uh, lawyer Gertrude. I yes, Doc. One of the students, uh, barrister. Okay. That uh, please, your screen is not transitioning. It is standstill. So, are you moving your screen? Ask um, me. I haven't moved it for a long time. Uh, so that's why. Um, I haven't moved it for a long time, but um, I think okay, it's transitioning. For example, now I'm transitioning, transitioning. Right. Right. That's good. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I mean, th this is just um, some some people may consider this to be a bit advanced, but uh, these are things that we have we may have come across while studying ADR. When we talk of the doctrine of separability, 
You see, remember? Oh, okay, Mr. Saki, yes. Yes, Mr. Saki, okay, please go on. Yeah, madam. I think the doctrine of separability has to do with um the the situation where the arbitration clause or the arbitration agreement is treated as a separate um, collateral agreement um, from the underlying or from the fundam or from the basic contract that was originally entered into the substantial the substantive contract mm. the arbitration clause is treated as a separate contract on its own from the substantive contract. Very good, very good. So like Mr. Saki is saying, the arbitration clause is treated as being a separate agreement to arbitrate, which is independent of the substantive contract in which it is embedded. And the reason is that th this principle is very essential because by virtue of this principle or this doctrine of separability, an arbitration clause is able to survive the invalidity of the main contract, such that even if the main contract is subsequently ruled to be invalid by virtue of maybe some vitiating factor or what have you, the arbitral clause survives it. So the, the doctrine allows us to separate the arbitration clause from the underlying or the substantive contract, such that even if there is some challenge related to the broader or the substantive contract, the arbitration clause is still will still be deemed to be valid. And by so doing, the panel of arbitrators or the arbitrator would still have the jurisdiction to preside over any issue arising out of the contract that the parties have. So this doctrine of separability is very important. It's very essential. There are other doctrines like competence, competence, uh, which we need not necessarily look at for now. But at least at a minimum, I think that it's important for us to understand what we mean by, by uh, separability. Now, remember we had said that an arbitral award, when we talk of the arbitral award, we are simply referring to the decision of the arbitrators is final and binding, meaning that it cannot be appealed. You cannot appeal the substantive uh, decision that the, 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 the panel of arbitrators or the arbitrator has made. However, what you can do is to have that award set aside, is to have that award set aside and they are laid down grounds upon which you can have that award set aside. So for example, a party might allege that in the course of the arbitration, the arbitrator did not follow the rules of natural justice. So maybe the arbitrator did not give that party a fair hearing, or maybe the arbitrator even went beyond, he exceeded his jurisdiction. So the jurisdiction that has been conferred on the arbitrator by the parties, he exceeded that jurisdiction. Or like we are saying, the arbitrator failed to abide by you know, the rules of natural justice. These are grounds upon which a party can apply to a court to have the arbitral award set aside. Mind you, setting aside the award is not the same as appealing the award. So you realize that the award can be set aside on the basis of some procedural irregularities. Procedural irregularities like breach of natural, the rules of natural justice, uh, the arbitrator having exceeded his jurisdiction and so on and so forth. But that does not mean that the, the, the decision, the substantive decision that the arbitrator has made is, is, is going to be changed by a court. No, that is not what it means, but the award in itself can be set aside. In that case, the court is essentially saying that because the arbitrator failed to abide by some um, procedural requirement, then the award cannot be allowed to what um, uh, cannot be maintained. So we need to be able to distinguish between or to know that the, the meaning of an award, an arbitral award being final and binding, and know that the fact that it is final and binding means that you cannot appeal it on the merits. Rather, what you can do is to apply to have it set aside. 
Now, the grounds for setting aside an award, um, you can find them in the Arbitration Act at 798. I'm getting the impression that we are running out of time a little. So some of the things I'm going to have to leave it for you to, you know, to, to look at by yourselves. Um, what of, let, let's briefly look at this concept of customary arbitration. Customary arbitration. But before I do that, I let me just pause. I yes. think before that, there's a, a question by mm -hmm. one of the students that uh, Madam Gertrude, in most contracts, I think Daniel Saki, okay. in most contractual agreement, we see arbitration clause. Why don't we have negotiation? Okay, with I've seen it. Process? Yes, yes. Um, well, Mr. Saki, this is interesting because. Um, for most, most contractual agreements that I have seen or I have even drafted, you realize that there'll be a clause that says that when there's a dispute, the parties would uh, attempt negotiation as a way of settlement, failing which they can appoint a mediator to mediate the matter, failing which they will then go to what? Arbitration. But of course, this remember that a contract is supposed to be made up of the... the the wishes of the parties. So it is all dependent on what the parties want. For more complex, let's say international commercial agreements, you can have uh, Maybe you take, for example, import. yes, you yes. take, for example, the, when it comes to the realm of international trade, when it comes to world trade organization, if you take the dispute settlement uh, uh, body, like the mm -hmm. Treaty setting it up as far as the Marrakesh Agreement, you you see a perfect reflection of what we just said, that where we have like you no know, state parties have uh, misunderstanding, you have to start as maybe like from negotiation, feeling that you go through mediation, conciliation, and then arbitration. So it's like the arbitration becomes more or less a graduated form of a, uh, ADL, but. As uh, you rightly said, it's a question of uh, what the parties will choose to put in the contract. Because well, you are making the contract. So if you want to provide for internal dispute resolution mechanism, you have a, a whole uh, range of choices. Yeah, so if you don't provide for negotiation or mediation or conciliation, but you just provided for arbitration, that is fine. But the fact that you have just arbitration clause does not mean that negotiation has been uh, outlawed. And as a matter of fact, uh, negotiation is always implied because negotiation simply means that they, you are trying to sit down to talk, isn't it? Or, and, and that may take place even if there is no explicit uh, uh, provision for that in the particular agreement. Uh, please, like I get to, they can continue. But uh, Doc, in fact, let me even engage you on this for the benefit of our students. I, I came across a very wonderful article by Professor Frimpong Pong uh, on the nature and constitutional, constitutionality of statutorily imposed or non-contractual arbitration in Ghana. I wish we would get the opportunity uh, to share this article. What, what is the title of the article, please? It's, it's a very recent one. Uh, let me get you the, the... Okay, maybe let me see if I can share my screen for you to... Oh, no, I'll, uh, I'll it for them. Okay. The nature... Uh, yeah, so there it is. The nature and constitutionality of statutorily imposed non-contractual arbitration in Ghana. Okay. Right. It's, it's published in the Journal of African Law, just 2021, just a few months ago. Uh, I don't think Professor Pong has been here yet, <laughs> but uh, maybe we need to take steps to get him to visit us. Now, you see, he makes a very interesting argument in this article. I'm sure some of you may have seen that sometimes in certain statutes, you would have a statute prescribing that parties necessarily go to arbitration over a matter. So for example, you can have a statute like Act 930, the Banks and Specialized Deposit Taking Institutions Act, which will prescribe that uh, with matters concerning the revocation of a, a regulated financial institution's uh, uh, license by the BOG, the parties would have to go to arbitration. Now, someone would ask, is, is this legal? In the sense that what if the, the, the aggrieved party is not interested in arbitration at all? 
He just simply wants to go to the court to have a court resolve its matter. So what Professor Frimpong Pong uh, argues in this article is that these statutorily imposed arbitration, in other words, these arbitrations that are prescribed by statute, they are not unconstitutional. They are not illegal. They are actually perfectly within the framework that we have with the legal framework for dispute resolution that we have in this country. So he makes the argument that for those, now mind you, he, di he distinguishes this statutory arbitration from contractual arbitration. So contractual arbitration is a sense of what maybe Mr. Saki is describing. He and maybe some of his international trade parties enter into some uh, uh, agreement and there's a clause within that agreement for arbitration. So for example, Pong calls that a contractual arbitration. And then he distinguishes that from the statutory arbitration where a statute is what actually says that, look, parties have to go to arbitration. And he argues that this is perfectly uh, legal. There's nothing illegal about it at all. Um, this may not necessarily be for our level, but um, I think that it makes an interesting read and we can all take the opportunity to, to, to read it once we, we, uh, we get the chance. So someone is asking, this means that ADR does not apply in criminal law because I think the law allows any room for negotiation in criminal matters. Why? For example, why doesn't the law allow the accused and victim to resort to any of the ADR mechanisms? All right, thank you. We'll come to that very soon. And we realize that it is not every matter that can be referred to ADR. There are some issues that are what excluded from ADR. Maybe this may even be a good chance to look at that now before we go to, uh, before we go to uh, customary um, arbitration. Now, remember when I was giving the outline of the discussion, I said that there were certain matters that are excluded from ADR processes. And for this, I got to. Yes. Uh, let me come in a minute. Sure. Uh, because of the, the question that was raised as whether ADR is uh, applicable in criminal cases. I want to refer the student to section 73 of the Act, 1993. Yeah, you even have it over there. So you touch on it, okay. And uh, since it's over here, then let me uh, yield for you to address it. Oh, no, Doc, you can go ahead. Okay, so uh, when it comes to uh, criminal cases, uh, there's a, a limited uh, uh, resort for uh, use of uh, ADR and uh, if we look at the session 73, you talk about promotion of a reconciliation in criminal cases. But of course, that will not apply to felony. I'm talking about the minor or misdemeanor or no petty uh, offenses. So let's say that somebody, that those kind of things, uh, ADL is uh, encouraged. But reconciliation, not in the normal ADL as in the uh, a civil litigation alternative that we will be discussing. So that is what I wanted to uh, draw the attention to. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Doctor. Yes. Yeah, so you you all heard. Uh, so please let's look at Section 73 of the Act. And then you see, even when you look at Section 1 of the ADR Act, it, it makes it clear they are, that the Act applies to matters other than those that relate to, and then it gives certain matters. So for example, matters relating to the national or the public interest, issues relating to the environment, the enforcement and interpretation of the constitution, or any other matter that by law cannot be settled by an ADR uh, mechanism. So for example, you want to seek uh, interpretation of a provision in the 1992 constitution, and then you tell your friends, oh, this one, let's take it to ADR. Clearly, this cannot be the case because we all know the framework for constitutional interpretation at the 1992 constitution. And we all know the court that has exclusive original jurisdiction on matters relating to the enforcement and interpretation of the constitution. Mm -hmm. Or even there's some matter uh, in the public interest or in the national interest. And you can think of a million of such. And then you say, oh, as for this matter, although it is in the public interest, let's submit it to ADR. No, that is not, that cannot be done or issues even related to the, the environment. Also, mind you, causes or matters affecting chieftaincy, causes or matters affecting chieftaincy cannot be submitted to ADR. These are
takes A pre-trial settlement is essentially the parties using ADR to see if they can resolve their commercial matter, failing which the case will then go back to a judge for adjudication. So the point we are simply making is that even the court of law through court-connected ADR are also gradually uh, employing ADR mechanisms as part of the judicial process of what resolving disputes. And I have given you instances of where you can see this in, in, in action. Um, okay, so with this, maybe let's briefly look at, uh, let's briefly look at customary arbitration. And uh, I want someone to come and tell us all they know about customary arbitration, let, so that I can also pause for a while and, and listen to you. Yes, Mr. Akua. Madam, my, my, my hands have been up for quite some time. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I didn't... It's a question that I just want to okay. want you to clarify. Uh, through the arbitration, you say you cannot appeal, but you can set aside based on certain contingent on certain things that happen. That is not complying to the non audio theorem party, then the, the arbitrator acting uh, or travelers and those kind of things. My question is, when settlement is set aside, what would they be referred back to different uh, 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 arbitrator or the court then assumes power to adjudicate the case? Okay, very good question. Um, Dr. Dapa, are, are you here with us? Okay, now, like I was saying, other, other once, other oh, oh, the question is, what is the legal implication of the setting aside of an arbitral award? He's simply asking that once an arbitral award has been set aside, does it mean that it is void, is of no legal effect? And in that case, if that is the case, will the parties be uh, referred to attempt another, another uh, arbitration? All right. Oh, so if it's set aside, for example, as having breach uh, audio term uh, pattern rule or any of the yes. natural justice. Yeah, so if it's, if, if, if it's set aside, so what it means is that the award is not binding and the, 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 the dispute stands unresolved. So yes. they have to, just like equivalent to having like a, a de novo trial, like in a normal litigation, when we say that uh, you have to go and try and try the matter again from afresh, de novo. So if the arbitral award is set aside, it, it means that the dispute or the grievance remains uh, uh, unresolved, unless mm -hmm. someone decides to appeal against the decision to set aside the arbitral award and is able to get uh, the original decision setting aside the, uh, the arbitral award, for example, uh, uh, restored. Right, the arbitral award restored yeah. has been set aside. The otherwise, if you don't succeed, it's it just like uh, the dispute not having been resolved. So you still have to go back and get it uh, resolved, either through the arbitral uh, process again, uh, as it were. Mm. Mm. All right. Yes, thank you, sir. So that's for you, Mr. Akowa. Barista, please, do you also have a question? Mm. On answer to my question, I was just saying that we should use the next five minutes to uh, talk about customer arbitration, which is a very likely uh, area of assessment on student, uh, for students. Yes, Bex. Uh, sorry, I want to find out, you talk about the court connected ADR. Please, this is a barrister speaking. Mm. So I realized that uh, in the past, the court, as I said, the judicial service nowadays, they, they are motivating the judges to apply the ADR in most of the processes. And I even learned that there's an ADR in the former chief judges, uh, leadership, Sophia, and the current chief judges. They are all trying to promote the ADR court. But I don't know if, uh, that to some extent, is it binding on the court 
like in a particular matter, they should recommend uh, ADR to the parties. And if so, the parties, because it's a mere recommendation by the court that we have to matter by <coughs> this method or this, is it compulsory for we, the parties, to really go and decide that, oh, we don't want to go and do any ADR process or alternative resolution. We just want to say by the court, I, I don't know, because mm -hmm. I, okay. I was in one of the court, and the, there was some misunderstanding between the parties and the, yeah, the parties actually want their matter to be oh, there, I think there's a problem, or oh. is it from my connection or from his connection? Is it before the court? Yeah. Yes, please. Hello, Doc, can you hear us? Yes, I, 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 think, I don't know if I understood him that, uh, like where the court has referred them to, yeah. If the parties do not want, is, is that the question? Or? And I think he's he's observing that nowadays it appears as if the courts are being urged to compulsorily employ ADR in yes, the district yes, resolution. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, it's actually a practice directive by the chief that says yes. that And you know, the, uh, there's one litigation uh, we are involved in. Uh, you'll be doing the ADL. Usually the judge at the, you know, after the application for directions, before that, will ask you to go and do the court connected ADL. Mm -hmm. If able to get it resolved, you can, the person, the judge may give a one month uh, time, right? That to try and get it resolved through ADL. If you are not successful, you come back and then you continue the traditional litigation. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Thank you so much, Doc. So like you are saying, the, the, these are even have come in the form of practice directions from the court. So it should tell you that, I mean, from the, from the chief justice. So the courts are now even being compulsorily required to, you know, send or attempt, get the parties to attempt uh, their own amicable settlements before proceeding to court. And it's important because you see, for us as um, lawyers or law students, sometimes we think that Life is all about litigation, but it's about time we have a change of mindset. Gradually, dispute resolution is moving away from the courts to ADR, where parties are empowered to resolve their disputes by themselves. So the observation that a, a barrister or your colleague made with respect to what is happening in our judicial system is a very important one, and which you also need to take uh, a, cue, a cue from. So even in practice, there are ADR practitioners who don't go to court they are not involved in litigation. So ADR has become an alternative practice area, even for lawyers. So uh, let me just use the opportunity to encourage you to consider uh, that as well. And we didn't have time to really go through the advantages of, of ADR, but uh, these are things you already know. And you've heard how arbitration can be very expensive. Sometimes it's, it's even pays much more than, than litigation. So in terms of being able to cater for your pockets, well, you, you don't have to be afraid. The ADR practitioners are making a lot of money in that regard as well. Yeah, so can we just finalize on customary arbitration so that we move on? Or so that we call it a night, I mean. Yes, can someone tell us a bit about customary arbitration? Okay, so I mean, simply, simply speaking, when we talk of... Um, Customary arbitration. Uh, we are simply looking at an, 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 well, if you may, an informal arbitration proceeding in which the parties submit their disputes to an independent third party who is called a customary arbitrator for a binding determination, just like in, uh, we, we do in arbitration, but this time around in accordance with the relevant customary law in accordance with the relevant customary law. Now, customary arbitration has been with us even before the system of uh, litigation through the courts was introduced by the British, by virtue of the Supreme Court ordinance. Customary arbitration is something that at our own level uh, we have done for so many years, even before the introduction of a formal judicial system for, for the settlement of disputes. So it is simply the parties to a dispute submitting their dispute to a customer arbitrator 
for that arbitrator to make a binding determination in accordance with the relevant customary law. Now, normally the, the, the focus or the discussion in this area is always on the things that must be present for us to say that there has been a valid customary arbitration. So the point we are simply making is that in order for us to say that there has been a valid customary arbitration, there are certain elements that must be present. And I'm sure we are all aware of these elements as they were listed in the case of Budu and Caesar by Olo Enuje. Anytime we hear of customary arbitration, one of the first authorities that comes to mind is the case of, or the decision of um, the, the dictator of Olo Enuje in Budu and Caesar. Now he had said, that for there to be a valid customary arbitration, the following must be present. One, a voluntary submission or consent to arbitration. So a voluntary submission of the disputes by the parties to arbitration for the purpose of having the dispute decided. Now, number two, there must also have been a prior agreement by both parties to accept the award of the arbitrator. So in addition to the fact that the parties must voluntarily submit to arbitration, and of course, there are so many issues concerning what would essentially amount to voluntary submission. We'll look at that soon. The parties must also have agreed prior to the arbitration that they are going to be bound by the arbitration award or the arbitral award that will be given by the customary arbitrator. Now, the third requirement is that the, the practice for the time being, which is being followed in the native court, must be followed as nearly as possible. So whatever practices and procedures are applicable in the native courts must be followed as nearly as possible. So for example, things like the observance of uh, jurisdictional limits by the arbitrator, the observance of the rules of natural justice, these are all things that must be followed by the customer arbitrator. And then finally, there must be publication of the arbitral award. There must be publication of the arbitral award. Publication here, not necessarily in the sense of uh, writing because we are all aware that, that customary law to a large extent uh, need, didn't know writing. But when we talk of publication, what we are simply saying is that the, the award that is given by the arbitrator at the end of the day, it, it, must, be, it, it must be concise. It must be precise. So it must not be ambiguous, you know, it must be certain. There must be some level of certainty to that award. And that could equally simply amount to what publication. Of course, publication could also mean that the award is written down for the benefit of the parties and for the benefit of, of, of any future issues that may arise. Now, when we talk of voluntary submission, what do we mean by voluntary submission? What do we mean by voluntary, the parties being able to voluntarily submit uh, the dispute to, to customer arbitration. Can anyone uh, help us with a view on that? These are all things that you know already. Mm? So let's not waste too much time on it. So let me stop sharing my screen for a while. Okay, Bex. Yes, Bex. Okay, please, by voluntary submission, um, there are certain indicators that usually show that you have voluntarily submitted. And one of them is the payment of fees. When you pay the fees of arbitration, it's deemed that you voluntarily submitted. And also when the full implication and purpose of the meeting is explained to you, of course, in the case of Guateng and Menu, then it can also be said that you voluntarily submitted to arbitration. Mm, interesting. So Max is saying that uh, there are a number of things that will amount to voluntary uh, submission to the customer arbitration. All right. Uh, yeah, Mr. or FJA, please unmute yourself and speak. FJA. Mm. Hello, Madam. Yes. Um, I want to also talk about the parties not being forced to take mm -hmm. their matter to uh, the customer arbitrator. They, they themselves willingly go there for the arbitration to take place on their behalf or something. Okay. Yeah. Okay, right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you are, you are all, you are all essentially right. You are all essentially, uh, essentially right. So I'll, I'll, <laughs> I guess I'll just defer to those views. But you see, um, closely, closely linked to this 
requirement of a voluntary submission is the fact that there must be a prior agreement by the parties to be bound, right? Because you see that once the parties, and I say it is closely linked, or rather maybe you can even say that it overlaps. And the, the reason is that once there's evidence of, of prior agreement by the parties to accept the award, that is also an evidence of voluntary submission, like Bex was saying, I think. So the first two requirements seem to be, you know, uh, linked in, in, in some way. And then, of course, we've mentioned the fact that the rules of natural justice must be adhered to at, at all times. The rules of natural justice must be adhered to by all times. Once again, uh, Olenu discusses this quite extensively in, in the case of Budu and Caesar and all those other cases that followed um, subsequent to that. There's a question. Okay, so even before I look at the question, you realize that once we have established that there has been a valid customary arbitration, then once again, it means that the, the, the parties are bound by the award and they cannot resolve from it. Mm? So it is binding on the parties. They, they cannot resolve from it. They cannot resolve from it. But once again, it is possible for that award to be set aside. I think we have belabored the point enough. The difference between setting aside an arbitral award and actually appealing it, which is not uh, permissible. So although the, the, the arbitral award which is gotten through customer arbitration is final and binding, it is also possible to be set aside um, on some similar grounds, just like what we have discussed in, 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 in arbitration itself. Um, there's a question here. Please, what is the effect of the prior agreement by the parties to be bound to the arbitration award. So Joseph is asking, what is the effect of the prior agreement by the parties to be bound to the arbitration award? Yeah, so Joseph, that, that simply means that once the parties have given their prior agreement to be bound, it means that like I've just said in my last point, they cannot resile from it. You cannot subsequently say that you are not happy with it. So uh, you, you don't want to uh, abide or follow the determination that has been made by the customary arbitrator anymore. Yes, Bex, your hand is up. Yes, please, madam. Um, I have a question. Um, you just said that uh, there is a right of appeal against the decision of um, a customary arbitration. But hey, when Bex, I was... Did I say that? You said you can take it to the court. I said you can set it aside. Oh, okay then I didn't get it. Like you remember that. the distinction we drew between setting aside the award and appealing? Okay. Yes. Then I didn't get it like that. Yes, because you see, even customarily, you realize that customary law uh, does not really provide a remedy for uh, vacating an award or setting aside an award. So if you are a party to a customary arbitration, and you want, to, you want to dispute the award, you just have to follow the procedure that has been followed, that has been provided by the English law. And that is what we refer to as what, having the award set aside. Bex, are you with us? Yes, please. So then what, what is the difference between that one and the right of appeal? That is why we are saying that you cannot appeal the award, remember that the award is final and it is binding as between the parties. Final and binding means that the parties cannot resolve from it and they also cannot what, appeal the award on its merits. What they can do is to apply to have it set aside. Okay, and then start a new trial on it. Go back, go back again to the, uh, the, the customer arbitration if, if that is what they want. Because like doctor said earlier, once the award is set aside, it is no longer in existence. It, it, no, it is no longer binding on the parties. It no longer has to be followed. Just like what we described in, in um, arbitration properly so-called. Okay. Daniel. Yes, madam. Yes. Madam, um, if you read article 131 of the 1992 Constitution, it is that um, appeals shall flow from the lower court, out of right or out of lease. Um, but I want to know, 
the finality of an arbitration award? Is it not an affront to Article 131? <laughs> Well, it, 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 I, I, in my opinion, it is not. You see, even with the, the, the defining or the unique thing about arbitration is the final and binding effect of the arbitral award. However, the courts are still able to intervene, but in a, to a limited extent, and to the extent that the award can be set aside for the breach of certain procedural irregularities, like I have said. So in my opinion, I don't think that it is a breach of the provision you have referred us to. Um, Doc, would you want to add something? Yes, uh, I think they are worried about the fact that the, the arbitral award from the customer arbitration is final. And it can only be set aside where you have maybe like elementary procedural breaches like the, the natural justice, isn't it? Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to appeal, you have to know that uh, appeal in our jurisdiction, we call it is by way of uh, rehearing. When you are doing appeal, it's like you are hearing the matter again. It's like the appellate uh, court is in the same position as the, the, the trial court, as it were. So in customer arbitration, you know how it is. We don't have formal recording of uh, proceedings. Although if you go to some uh, traditional places like the Asante Henry's place and some others, they have adopted some practice, but it's not intrinsic to customer arbitration. It's a good practice, but it's not a uh, essential requirement. And for that matter, if you are appealing, the appellate court does not have the benefit of the, of the record. And again, in terms of evidence, uh, which is adduce and all that. Apart from elementary principles like the you know, natural justice, we don't follow the strict principles of laws of the uh, law of evidence as under our evidence act as it were. So there's uh, you no know, much flexibility as is consistent with the the, the 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 peculiarities of our our customer law, our customer system, and for that matter, customer arbitration. And that explains why, if, for example, your point is that you're not giving a hearing, the like the panel did not hear you or did not allow you to put your version or whatever issue a stick, or if you are saying that the panel, for example, had an interest in the matter or they were biased and you can prove it, and I mean those are different matters. Those are elementary principles of natural justice, and. Uh, there will be some of the things which will lead to it being uh, set aside, as it were. I think those are the uh, some of the other thoughts that I have. Can I get you? Okay, Doc. Thank you so much. So um, we are uh, okay. I think there are some more hands. Um, McDonald. McDonald or Bex. If, if you have a question, please, because we are essentially bringing the class to an end, Doc, unless I'm, I'm wrong. <laughs> and there's a question about who has the capacity to be an arbitrator under customary law. Can anyone be an arbitrator under customary law? Yeah, um, madam. Please go on. Hello. Please go on. Okay, so thank you very much. Like. Uh, Something, I witnessed something in court and I want to ask if that is similar to customary arbitration. So whilst the case was going on, the interpreter comes in and says that he wants the, or the nana or the chief of the town has asked him to come and then bring the matter to, to the house to go and settle or to the palace to settle. Then what I normally get the judge saying that to bring the text into writing and bring it to the court so that the court will adopt it as a consent judgment. Mm. I want to know if that is um, an example of a customary arbitration. <laughs> okay, so I think my response to that will be to um, ask whether uh, the elements of a valid customary arbitration which we we have just outlined whether you think they are present in that incident that you witnessed in court 
Now, it could also be that what transpired was just an act of the parties requesting to have the matter settled out of court or to attempt to have the matter settled out of court, which is also very much permissible under, under our current framework. So the point is that it could simply be the parties attempting ADR. But for us to say that it is customary arbitration, it's not because of the fact that the Ochiami or the Nana is the one who came to court to say that, but we need to ask ourselves whether the elements uh, laid down uh, in the cases we have just looked at are present. Oh, okay. Yes, final one by Beg. Doctor. <laughs> okay, madam, please. Um, my my question and my confusion is still about the point three, the, the fact that the award must not be arbitrary. Um, I think Sorry, that when I was reading, the award must not be arbitrary, where okay. we apply the rules of natural justice. Okay. In my reading, I realized that Ole Nuje, in trying to explain the point, said that there will be a grave injustice mm -hmm. if the decisions are arbitrary. Mm -hmm. So then I'm thinking that if the award can be set aside based on arbitrariness, why would he then say that it will be a grave injustice if the award is given arbitrarily? I think that was my confusion when I was asking the previous oh, question. And I mean, yeah, I, I think I understand you. And yes, um, I, we totally all agree with Ole Nude that in giving out the award or in you know, um, making a final determination, it must not be done in an arbitrary manner. It must be done, the, the, remember one of the principles is the fact that the practice and procedure must as far as possible be followed. So you cannot, for example, refuse to give one of the parties a hearing or you know, adequate time and preparation and all those things that come under the ambit of the rules of natural justice. But I also think that the fact that Ole Nuje says that does not necessarily mean that he's implying that the award should not be subject to setting aside. What he may possibly be trying to say is that, look, one of the essential elements of customary arbitration is the fact that it must not be done arbitrarily. If it is done that way, there's a chance of grave injustice being occasioned to one of the parties or even both of them. So let's even avoid it. But that does not take away the fact that if it should happen, there's a remedy for that. And that remedy lies in what? Setting aside that award. Madam Bex. <laughs> Hello. Yes, please. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, you very much. Yes, Dr. Rapa. The other thing I should add on setting aside yeah. is that you might have heard the principle that uh, uh, fraud will sweet everything, right? So it is also possible if you can even establish that uh, an award was uh, obtained from a customer arbitration as a result of a fraud. If you can prove that, that could be a ground for it also to be impeached. So that was just by the way. Okay. Doctor, please. Yes. Yeah. No, no, no. I am in your hands at this moment because um. I think that I have exhausted my the pointers okay, in my. So just before you go, uh, since we have uh, some questions from your school, uh, oh, really? some we have from uh, PSC. So I thought that if you take advantage of your presence here, even for ten minutes, uh, just to uh, say. A word or two. So uh, just in a second, I will just share the screen from my uh, end. And, uh, you know, I have two categories of students. One category, they will like this type of uh, discussion, just trying to learn and understand. In the other category to we call them the ever, the ever, meaning that they're interested in just the <laughs> in question which are coming. So we try to satisfy, uh, what do you call it, the, the both uh, uh, interests. So we have some, when you are giving like, a, you know, a focused discussion like you have beautifully done, they are just itching to get questions. And you have some who think that the questions are not really important, but you should just get understanding so that whatever question come, You'll be able to uh, uh, do it. Well, I get it. 
Yes, sir. Uh, so we have uh, this kind of thing. So what I'm, I'm doing now is that uh, one of them sent uh, this, oh my goodness, we don't know this here, sent um, this thing from uh, UPSC. I don't know if, uh, can you see? Yes, please. Uh, so what we do is that uh, we stay there, when we read the question, then the, the stop principle around it. We just discuss it and then we try to uh, work out mm. the double answer. So uh, if we could start from, let's say like the question one, mm. A defender may use his land in a non-natural manner as long as his conduct is reasonable. Uh, <clears throat> as soon as you see a statement like this, what principle does it remind you of? We've discussed this many times in this session. But it's good that the yes, they've anticipated it in their mock, meaning that uh, it probably has a good chance because most of the more questions we'll be looking is, is running through them. A defender may use his land in a non-natural non non manner as long as his conduct is reasonable. This statement is, uh, can anybody give it a go? Hello? Yes, please. Sir, so I think it's uh, Rayland and Fletcher. Can you state the principle of Rayland and Fletcher so that in case someone has forgotten, Mm. Anybody see the principle in reliance and pleasure? Yes. Uh, just unmute yourself and uh, state it. Uh, yes. Hello, yes, Daniel. Uh -huh. So I think the principle under reliance and fracture is that when you put your land into a non natural use by accumulating a thing on the land, and that thing escapes to cause a mischief on the land of your neighbor, um, you'll be liable. Okay, all right, good. So as I always tell you, it's better to test the correctness of your answer uh, by going through all the options. So we have uh, option A, uh, the statement is A, true of nuisance, but false, with respect to the rule in reliance and pleasure, is that correct? What is the principle governing uh, nuisance? Public and private nuisance. Can anybody summarize the principle for us? Okay, Doc. Uh, okay, yes, go ahead. Okay, so I think the principle in nuisance is that um, one, your conduct must be unreasonable and that unreasonable indirect conduct of yours must cause a physical injury to another person's land or interfere with his enjoyment of his land. So I think if the conduct is reasonable, then it will be true with, um, it, it will be, it will like, as long as it is reasonable, you can be held liable for nuisance, but even though your conduct might be reasonable, if the accumulation escape and cause a mischief, you can be held liable under a violence and Yeah, so uh, you having a reasonable is not a defense to a nation against violence and pleasure. Is that what you are saying? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so that the Rollins and, and Fletcher, as it were, appears like a, what you call like a sort of like a strict liability type of word, of thought, as it were. Good. Okay, so uh, we have A, but don't let us uh, uh, say that we we have the answer, so we are abandoning the rest of the options. We have to continue to test the correctness of the answer using the elimination method. So B. True of the rule in reliance and flesh but false with respect to nuisance. So if you understand uh, the principle of reliance and flesh that once uh, you brought some which is a non-natural user, it's accumulated and then it's escaped. 
it doesn't matter uh, how reasonable that you were, so long as it has escaped and it has caused uh, uh, trouble to your neighbor. Yeah. yeah, Anthony, you want to say something? Anthony, you for me, Todd, I said, do you want to say something? Like no, I like guess you want to share some thoughts. Like I get through, do you want to share some, some miss? Ama. I think she's away. Okay. All right. So you, you can notice that the right away we can uh, dismiss uh, uh, B. Uh, C. Uh, false with respect to both nuisance, then the rule in Rollins and Fletcher, uh, where your conduct does not defy reasonableness. Uh, you could escape uh, liability under mm -hmm. nuisance. Then the true with respect to nuisance, and then the rule in Rollins and Fletcher, uh, no, the two cannot be true so that you validate uh, A as the uh, answer. And you have a lot of cases in violence and inflation. Okay. Uh, the claim brought under the rule in violence and inflation failed in Dublin and Ghana Housing Corporation. Uh, who is familiar with Ghana Housing, uh, Dublin against Ghana Housing Corporation? Anybody? Dublin against Ghana Housing Corporation. Who is familiar with that decision? Can you just tell us? Is anybody familiar with Dublin against Ghana House uh, Corporation? Yes, uh, Ellen, you can mute yourself and tell us. Yeah, so uh, uh, in Dublin and uh, Ghana housing, I think they were neighbors and uh, the defendant's uh, land was on a hill where, uh, or what, yes, where anytime there was a rain, it caused some sort of flooding. So the defendant took it upon himself to construct some gutters to enable a free flow of the water. But that uh, sort of aggravated the flooding that occurred on the plaintiff's land. And so anytime it rained, it flooded the plaintiff's land. And so the tenants left. And so she took an action in Ryland and Fletcher against the uh, defendant. But that the action failed because the court held that there wasn't any accumulation. The defendant didn't accumulate anything that caused any mistake. So basically, that was the decision in that case. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ellen, for sharing your brief with us. Yeah, so the action brought under, yeah, it's somebody, uh, somebody's not up to the same uh, Ellen. The action uh, failed uh, because A, there was no non-national use of the defendant's land. B, the defendant brought nothing onto the land. C, there was no accumulation by the defendant. D, that which the defendant brought onto his land was not something that was likely to cause mischief. Uh, e, none of the above. Because okay, this is the, the type of question uh, which requires uh, Either you know you're familiar with the authority or you're not familiar with it. That's me uh, telling you. There are some questions that you can use uh, elimination method or you can use a common sense uh, approach. If you don't uh, remember the particular interest, but there are some too which requires that uh, you know it or you don't know it. So if you haven't read uh, the case of Dublin against Ghana Housing Corporation, you not be able to uh, answer. Yes, Ellen has told us that, yeah, Barista. Yeah, dog, so looking at the option, 
Yes, option B and C. I don't know, but <laughs> the weather seems to be similar. We are bringing something onto the land and then accumulating it. I don't know if there's a different two. Okay. I mean, uh, so what? The B, you mean B and C? Yes. So that the defendant brought nothing onto his land and see there was no accumulation by the defendant. Okay, so I understand your viewpoint that uh, B and C are essentially the same. So elimination method can let to knock uh, them out. Is that the case? Is that what you want yes. to say? So that we are left with just the yes. we are left with the the uh, three uh, options. So how do you juggle between uh, A and B? There was no non-natural use of defendant's land and D, uh, which the defendant brought onto his land was not something that was likely to cause mischief. Uh, Ellen. Ellen. Yes, Doug. Yes. What uh, was the basis for the decision of the court at the action field? The action field because the court was of the view that the defendant did not accumulate anything on his land that caused any mischief to the, the plaintiff's uh, 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 land. And the rule in Lyra and Fletcher, you should be able to prove all the elements that there was an unnatural use of the land. He accumulated something that was capable of causing mischief when it escapes. So you read the decision and it clearly said that, it, it clearly says that the defendant did not accumulate anything on the land. So maybe when you are dealing with Ryan and Fletcher and you look at the option B and C, you, 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 you because of the, uh, uh, the principle you are dealing with, you are likely to be more inclined to C than B. That's what I think. Yeah. Thank you. But then, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for your contribution, Ellen. But so, coming back to the question, if the decision was that uh, there was no uh, accumulation, which was likely to call uh, mischief. So, let's, so that means that uh, you, are, you are looking at the Looking at D, that which the defendant brought onto his land was not was not something that was likely to cause mischief. No, he didn't. The defendant didn't accumulate anything on his land in the first place because he barely constructed gutters right. to aid the free flow of water. And in okay. Lyon and Flesher, you should have accumulated something. But it's not just any accumulation. Accumulation usually relates to non-natural use, isn't it? Yes. Good. Yeah, so uh, A was saying that there was no non-natural use of the defendant's land. So if you ignore, let's say A, and you just go straight to there was no accumulation by the defendant. We say no accumulation, of course, but because of how the question is framed, it is reasonable to see uh, C as the more uh, suitable answer. Because the question has told us that uh, the principle in Rollins and Fletcher failed in Dublin. Why? Right. So we know the elements of Rollins and Fletcher. So therefore, if you say there was no accumulation, the accumulation is not just in a neutral context. We are talking about accumulation of something uh, which is a, a non-natural uh, user. So in that case, uh, uh, C uh, will be more suitable than uh, the other options. Let's look at about three more questions and probably that uh, lawyer get to and go and rest. Lawyer get to it. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, I'll turn there. There is gone. There is gone. All right. Okay, so let's look at the three. Uh, which of the following is not an essential? Elements for successful claim in false imprisonment. Uh, can somebody tell us uh, the principle which govern false imprisonment?
false imprisonment. This is a basic part. Okay, if, if you are not prepared. Uh, we know that uh, false imprisonment is where someone has delimited the space, right? And has uh, confined you. The confinement need not be actually like actual physical confinement, like maybe a fence with around you, no. But so long as you are confined a limited uh, space uh, beyond which you cannot uh, freely uh, uh, move away on your own, that will amount to false imprisonment. So therefore, we look at it, uh, which of the following is not an essential element for successful clean enforcement? A, total bodily restraint. Uh, that is, you are completely uh, restrained. Uh, you are not really, you don't need to be like totally restrained before you can say that you are falsely imprisoned. So, but then let's uh, flag that. It's not, let's move on to the next B, imprisonment in a room. Uh, Imprisonment in a room is a false imprisonment, but as I said, it need not always be that you are in that. So let's look at the other one, see no means of escape. Yes, no means of escape is definitely uh, an element. D, no justification for uh, the restraint. Okay, so if you have uh, the limited uh, space a person cannot like uh, uh, move away from, and uh, you have no lawful justification for doing that, uh, you have falsely imprisoned the person. But the emphasis is on the not an essential element, meaning that all the elements here, they are, they can be applicable for false imprisonment, but one of them is not very material, and even without it, you can still talk of false imprisonment. Uh, you go for imprisonment in a room, right? So B will become like the most suitable answer because you don't need to uh, put someone in a room only before you can talk about false imprisonment. Otherwise, you are telling us that whenever you have not been able to confine a person in a room, then you don't have false imprisonment. You can still, uh, you know, falsely imprison someone if, for example, let's say that you have have a weapon or you threaten the person that uh, don't move beyond this point or don't uh, just be there. Otherwise, if you go, I blow your head or something like that. That uh, would be a sort of like a false imprisonment. Does anybody have a different uh, position regarding the discussion we are doing? Oh, you're not with me. Okay, so if you look at the uh, Professor Ophelsis, uh, uh, nice way, the uh, law of thought in Ghana, uh, he defines false imprisonment as, quote, the unlawful imposition of restraints on Please, if you are not talking, you can mute yourself. Uh, when you want to talk, then you are mute yourself. Okay, please, can you check your mic? Please, are you here? Please, are you here? Just uh, check your mic. Let me see if I can. Please, well, please, the, 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 the mic is on. Okay. Yeah, so uh, false imprisonment is the unlawful imposition of restraint on another's freedom of movement from a particular place, from a particular place. So to establish that, you need to show that the restriction imposed upon the plaintiff or the claimant's liberty as well was unlawful. So uh, those are, so the restraint uh, must be uh, total. So A is fine. Uh, play scenario of uh, confinement. And the, it is a false imprisonment to confine in a house, in a prison, in a mine, in a vehicle, driving a car at such a speed as to prevent the prisoner from uh, alighting his false imprisonment or in an aircraft. The area of confinement must have a boundary and the boundary must be fixed by the defendant. So that is why I said that the uh, B is not a necessary, uh, is not an essential element. 
it's not only putting the person in a room alone. So what the most important is that you've delimited the, the boundary, like the space beyond which the person cannot move in, then that is the force in prison. Barrister, please, go ahead. Yeah, Doc, I, I agree that B should be the answer, but <laughs> sometimes the confusion usually lies in the answers, because if you look at a C2, no means of escape. Yes, no, me, no means, uh -huh. yeah, no means of escape, I think is essential, because that is the element of confinement. Because false imprisonment also means confinement, right? Confi you are, so that there's that restriction on your freedom to move. You, have, you cannot move as you choose because you are confined, right? And if you are yes. confined, what no. is that don't have the means of escaping? Or? Yeah, my argument is that when you read other texts, they are saying that if there is a, some means of escape yes, and provided that it is Provided that there's a, a, a reasonable escape, yes, you, you can equally go. That's like the B, we say that imprisonment can be done in the room, in the open, all that. So it is not only in the room or a physical structure that you can bring an action again. So in the same means, when you talk about the escape, it is not absolute. There can be some means. Provided it is absolutely maybe reasonable, so sometimes the options, I mean, usually mean yeah, the okay. same. Ba 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 Barrister, I I perfectly understand your viewpoint, but as I keep telling you that in this type of uh, exams, especially <laughs> when it comes to multiple choice, please uh, pay attention to the when it comes to the multiple choice, if you ask. As we talk to examiners, right, they even uh, acknowledge that uh, sometimes uh, whoever put the questions together and the answers, some of the things are very debatable. But we don't have the luxury of challenging the questions or challenging the correctness of the options. We need to be able to work out what the, the emphasis is, the most suitable answer, right? Or in the primary school, uh, the, the secondary school, like the most likely uh, uh, answer. The most likely, the most likely or the most suitable doesn't mean that it is like the 100% the accurate answer. No. So within whatever options that you have, which one is like the most suitable? Yes, uh, John, please. John? Uh, John, your hand is up. You can mute yourself. Yeah, Kazo. Yes, sir. I think that um, on the element, uh, no means of escape. Yes. I don't know. I don't know where barristers' confusion comes in there, but I think that it is absolute that once there is a means of escape, first imprisonment will not lie. Yeah. Yeah. So if there is right. a little means of escape, first imprisonment will not lie. Right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah. So which of the following is an accurate statement of the law? A, in a thought of false imprisonment, any form of restraint is prima facie unlawful. Is that the case? Any form of restraint. What about if there's a justification for the restraint? If there's a justification for the, uh, yeah. Uh, B, in the thought, let's go through the rest before we settle on the correct answer. In the thought of false imprisonment, the onus never shifts to the defendant, notwithstanding that the plaintiff establishes a restraint by the defendant. I mean, that is not correct because if you have someone is complaining that you falsely imprison me. You confine me or you delimited me in a particular space, a vehicle, car, I mean, a room or wherever, or even open space, but some things were there prevent me from escaping. Now, once the plaintiff has, uh, has shown that, then you, the defender, you, the alert or visa, you will have to have the bedding to, to rebut that. So the bedding will definitely shift to you. So the B is, not, is never correct. Uh, C, in the thought of false imprisonment, 
restraint is unlawful only under specific condition. Restraint is unlawful only under uh, specific condition, meaning that uh, apart from certain, uh, of course, so that makes sense because we say that you must not have a lawful justification, isn't it? So if you have like a lawful justification, then the restraint is permissible. So it is right to say that in a total force imprisonment, restraint is unlawful only under specific conditions. And those specific conditions are where uh, you have the justification, maybe like either a police officer or the court has made or whatever, any other, as we know. Uh, D, none of the above. So which of the following is an accurate statement of the law? So the with def definitely B is wrong. And then if you take, uh, so the competition between A and C, but uh, if you, let's go back to A, in the total force imprisonment, any form of restraint is prima facie uh, unlawful. So if you, uh, but that one is not true. Uh, so that what you are trying to say is that as a general rule, anytime you have uh, limited uh, someone's uh, uh, freedom of movement, his ability to move about, then that is uh, uh, unlawful, except that it can be rebutted. It can be rebutted by you saying that uh, you have uh, what you call like the, the, the justification or uh, lawful reason for restraining the person. Uh, Okay, I mean, that's, but let's look at the, uh, the C again. In a total force imprisonment, restraint is unlawful only under uh, specific uh, conditions. So what that means is that uh, uh, the statement is suggesting that apart from specific conditions, all restraints, uh, are unlawful. And that is true. So I will go in for C. I think that uh, uh, C is a, a, a better uh, response because let's, let's uh, 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 demonstrate why A is not uh, a, a, a suitable answer. Let's suppose that uh, the court has remanded you, right? The court has remanded you that is a, is, a, is a form of restraint. Will that amount to uh, the restraint being unlawful? Certainly not. So the argument that any restraint is prima facie, prima facie means that so long as someone is restrained, then uh, the initial uh, conclusion or the initial assumption or the initial impression is that that restraint is unlawful. That is not uh, uh, really the case. Now, some cases, yes, that may be true, but there are other cases that is not is, that's not the case. And that is why I will prefer uh, C as uh, maybe like the most accurate statement of the law. Has anybody got like a contrary uh, opinion? Okay, so I think it's 11.36 now, and the number is going, I mean, the people are going to bed. So this is a, a good point to say uh, goodbye. And then uh, tomorrow, uh, we have, I think about two or three, we have about three sessions. Uh, there'll be a short, uh, I'll have an after, as, afternoon session with you on my own. And then at, uh, I think 5.30, as uh, Denise said, hey, that's of the Court of Appeal who come and do some uh, land law with us. And then uh, in the night, I have uh, another uh, colleague who wants to come and do uh, some brush up with the legal system with us. And then uh, I've also gotten the Deputy Attorney General, uh, Mr. Tuaye Boa. I used to teach with him some time ago before he got the, this new appointment. He too will come and uh, discuss some few things we do, either Saturday or on Sunday. And then uh, uh, Dr. Bassett will also come 
and do some constitutional law with you uh, Sunday evening. So have a very good night.